This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. As the summer days are flying by, we're getting closer to the Farm Progress Show on this weekend's This Week in Agribusiness. Hello, everyone. We welcome you to our weekend broadcast here, along with Mr. Mike Pearson. We have with us, yeah, hey, pal, you, you can't move in as a show host here, Matt Youngman from the Farm Progress Show. Good to be with you. Good to see you, too. We thought we'd get a little bit of a briefing from you this weekend about that show that is rapidly approaching. The calendar says just about a month away now. That's exactly right. August 30, 31, and September 1st, it'll just be here before you know it. You've been to that show many times through the years, haven't you, Mike? You always I, enjoy going? I love going to the Farm Progress Show, especially when it's in Boone, my home state. Matt, I'm curious, getting into Farm Progress is always a bit of a thing. There's a huge crowd trying to get there. I understand we're making it better. Yeah, you know, we need to thank the Iowa Department of Transportation. We've been working with them for something that for the 2024 show will really be wonderful. It'll be a, a brand new route into the show. It's going to be an overpass over the railroad tracks, but for this year, they've kind of got about half the work done, and part of that is a third lane of traffic on the west side of the show site. So that big um, push of one-way traffic that we get in the mornings to feed into the parking lot, we've got more room to for everybody to stretch out and 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 it really stack up stack up that if we need to have a backup so that we don't get out on Highway 30 with a backup, which is where it gets dangerous. So, you know, they've done a great job. The, st the Department of Transportation worked with us to get that done in between shows and get it cleaned up and ready to go for the show coming up. And it's hard to believe this new this show is coming up. And Matt, as you think about what is developing there on the grounds, things have changed for the layout. It's going to be important for folks to get their maps, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, we haven't, we haven't had a live in-person show in Boone since 2018. That's four years ago, and there's been a lot of change in the industry. So mergers and acquisitions and a lot of change. So it's created quite a shuffle on the, sh on the show site. People that, that you were used to seeing in a certain place may have moved somewhere else. So um, yeah, get your map, but they're all there and, and everybody's, the, the work has already begun. The tents are going in the air and the action is picking up on site. Some new exhibitors, some folks that maybe haven't been there in the past, I understand. Yeah, lots from about every category. You know, since 2018, a lot of autonomous things have been added to the lineup, and they'll, a lot of them will be running out there in that autonomy zone. You have new things like the Rise, which I was telling you about earlier, is is kind of like a, it's it's like a Georgia Jetson type uh, vehicle to help help move you around your farm. A person flies in it. Yes, it's if you imagine like a six copter drone, six six rotor drone. It's a really big one of those with a cockpit in it, and you can you can get up and fly around. It doesn't take any additional permitting or licensing to fly it. You just you just climb. In I can fly. climb in it and fly it today. <laughs> if 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 you if have if me. you have the guts to do it, yes, you can climb in it and fly it 60 miles an hour if you'd like. We tend to focus on the equipment. Most yeah. of us are really into the the iron and the tires, but in actuality, the varied industries tent is always a focus of attention for folks going to the show. Many will not want to have some parts they want to acquire or make contact with someone in there. And you've really upgraded it. We have, you know, and the thing about the Varied Industries tent is that that's kind of the entry point. All the great stories of exhibitors at the Farm Progress Show, almost all of them started with a booth, a 10 by 10 booth, and then they grew from there. So that's kind of the place you can go and see what's new and what's what's coming down the line or the newest entrance to the show. But the format of it, the, the layout has been significantly improved with the help of uh, the Iowa Soybean Association, Iowa State University, we have put a soy-based asphalt surface in that tent, and that's going to make the experience so much better for the visitors and really for the exhibitors that have to stand in there for three straight days. Sometimes they would be in the mud or sometimes it would be dusty, but, you know, the environment in there with a, a soybean-based asphalt, it was a perfect fit. It's going to do a lot of good for that facility in the off-season when we're gone, when they use that place for other events to have that. It's, it's just short of an acre of asphalt there on the show wow. site. Field demonstrations, they always draw the producers to the field, and I would imagine this year will be no exception. Weather permitting, you'll have combines running, grain carts running, yes, tractors. Yes, tractors, um, tillage, we'll, ha we'll have all that running. You know, the, the crop is in great shape. They had a tough spring in central Iowa. Everything was ready to go. We were all ready to go in, in the middle of April, but Mother Nature didn't necessarily agree. So the corn went in May 12th. Uh, but fortunately, it's been a hot summer. Uh, with the exception of this last week, it's been a real hot summer, and it's going to be again, according to Greg's forecast, to help bring that corn along. It's been catching up really well. I saw some pictures of some ears, and we look like we're we're on pace. Might be a little wet towards the beginning of the show, but but we'll be okay. 
in terms of crop moisture, That's exactly moisture right. content of the corn. Yep. Uh, we'll hope for dry conditions in the fields at showtime and uh, moderate temperatures. We want to visit with Matt Youngman a little bit more about this year's Farm Progress Show rapidly approaching. He'll be back in a few minutes. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. The Firestone Ag Dealer Network offers you the support, inventory, and resources you need. Visit FirestoneAg.com to find your local certified dealer. Now it's time to take a look at the markets. And joining us this week is Michael Reginelli. He's a vice president at Advance Trading. And Michael, let's talk yeah. about this wheat market. Very volatile this past yeah. week. Started with this Russia-Ukraine grain accord. What yeah. happens over there? What's happening over there? Yeah, a lot of lot of questions still, Mike. As we're as we're kind of working through it, and and to actually see what transpires on the back end, I think there's there's still obviously more questions than answers. But I think in general, what's going on obviously is as food inflation continues to accelerate. Um, there's just there's a desperate need to to get product into global markets. So trying to strike an accord, obviously with Russia being such a massive producer and exporter of wheat, it's critical that you know their supply, particularly in developing countries and countries that are consistently at a deficit and can't produce themselves, get access to the supply. So trying to kind of bridge the gap here, find ways to release those stocks into the world market. Easier said than done, at least at this point in time. And so I think the market's still grappling with it. I don't think we're, we're hard-coded, um, but some of those deals or the information surrounding the deal still still emerging at this point. So it seems pretty likely that the wheat yeah. market's going to be susceptible to headline risk. Any news Big of this time. grain export moving forward is going to drive that market down. hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. And I think we're going to be in that cycle, unfortunately, for, for, for a long period of time here. Um, All right. Lots yeah. of grain over there in Eastern Europe. Tons. Michael, while we're thinking about the wheat market, obviously the spring wheat crop yes. has been a crop of a lot of concern this year, given the wetness in North Dakota. Right. The wheat quality tours going on or went on this past week. Yep. What do we learn? Yeah, we, uh, we have colleagues that are participating in the tour, uh, caught up with them this week. Honestly, they said despite like the massive variability in planting, you know, it was kind of all over the place on when that crop went in. It was, you know, pretty spread out with uh, heavy amounts of moisture. They're kind of saying that the yields honestly look pretty good across mm -hmm. space. Um, you know, any of the preventative plant was probably more related to corn than it was the, the beans or the wheat. Um, they're saying USDA and uh, they're kind of in agreement with very high yield thresholds from, from everything that they've seen, particularly in the eastern parts of the growing area. So somewhat optimistic from what I've heard, at least at this point coming out of the quality tour. Somewhat optimistic on supply, which sounds like it might be kind of bearish on price. Michael, are we sure. going to see this volume overall pushing spring wheat prices down? Uh, it, potentially, yeah. I mean, we still, we still have a ways to go here, obviously, you know. And I would say harvest is going to be anywhere from two to three weeks late, kind of based on, on the data that we've seen. But yeah, that, that's a fair point. Um, if, if supply ramps up here, uh, you know, we obviously could see some price pressure, but demand is going to be the other big thing too, because as we know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uncertainty, particularly in the global markets, on on how we're going to be able to facilitate supply to meet those demand thresholds. So, if demand ultimately calls for it, then all, you know that could support prices despite you know, an influx or uh, replenishment of supply. Well, with with the demand in focus here, export sales on wheat have been disappointing. Yeah. Are they starting to turn around? Uh, yes and no. Uh, today, I think we were kind of right in the, or, well, Thursday, we would have been right in the middle of the range on the weekly export sales uh, from kind of what the expectations were. Uh, but so far, we're not really seeing it come to the U.S. in a big way. A big part of that, is, too, is the U.S. dollar just a couple of weeks ago was nearing 20-year highs. And it, it's still at a very, very high threshold. So that, that's a challenge because for global buyers, it just makes U.S. prices more expensive. So to come to the U.S. and, and buy wheat, you know, in mass, it's it's not it's easier said than than done at this point from an economic standpoint. And with the Federal Reserve hiking interest rates mm -hmm. at other 75 basis points this week, I imagine the dollar is going to get stronger. Michael, is that your take? In, in general, I think that's kind of the general presumption is, is that the U.S. dollar will continue to be supported, you know, as, as the rate hikes continue, you know, another 75 basis points. It just feels like we continue to to lift. And so, um, yeah, so, I mean, the U.S. dollars come off those highs that we saw a couple weeks ago, but in general, we're very much at the high end of the range here, and it feels like we're going to continue to be there for, for the balance of 2022. Lots of things moving these commodity yeah. markets this summer. We'll be back to talk more of them with Michael Reginelli from ATI. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. Harvey Firestone invented the first pneumatic farm tire, forever changing what it means to farm hard. Visit firestoneag.com to learn more about this history and tire solutions for today. 
And we're talking markets with Michael Reginelli of ATI. And Michael, we have seen this corn crop go back and forth as every weather forecast comes out. Yep. Bring us up to speed on the demand side. Yep. How's basis holding up in the country? Still, still very firm uh, in the old crop channels, uh, particularly in the export side, even though we're not seeing massive amounts of demand come in, river basis still is, is very firm uh, for, for August SEP. Eventually it should converge down to new crop values. We're just not quite there yet. Some of it is the domestic pool. Um, you know, ethanol is still, you know, trying to kind of get covered. We're in that weird period where we're trying to bridge the gap from old crop to new crop. And so there's still pretty healthy premiums out there, um, you know, on the ethanol side, even on the feed side, as we're trying to kind of get to uh, new crop supply and, and replenishment there. But overall, very strong tenure in the cash markets. With those river bids being so strong, mm -hmm. Michael, does that tell you that more exports are coming down the line? They just haven't hit the books quite yet? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, exports have been somewhat uh, underwhelming, uh, but you know, it's we, we could see additional demand come in. There's a lot of questions around that, though, Mike, because we have the safrina crop in Brazil coming, you know, coming off here in the very near future. It's going to be probably 20 million metric tons bigger, call it 800 million bushels bigger than it was a year ago. But last summer, we also had a pretty significant issue where you know, their production just kind of fell by the wayside late in the year. So they will have more stocks, which could bite into September, October, November exports. But the European corn crop also seems to be kind of falling apart at the seams. I think the USDA is at 68 million. We have uh, people over there that we talk to that are sub 60 million on production. So, you know, that, that could impact Black Sea exports too. And obviously, you know, what's gonna happen with Ukraine and, and are they gonna be able to export? You know, nothing's moving out of Odessa, which is one of their biggest export ports currently. And so that, that's, you know, kind of one of those questions that we're dealing with. It certainly is. On the ethanol side, you mentioned uh, we, we did see stocks come down, so drivers do appear to be using more ethanol, at least over the summer months. Yeah. But this time of year, I imagine we do tend to see production slow down in that industry, don't we? Yes. Yeah, you're right, Mike. So, uh, you know, you'll have some maintenance, you'll have some downtime, seasonal downtimes. It's it's typical at this time of year. Um, so, uh, you know, demand's been pretty good this summer, but it does feel like, you know, we are seeing it kind of ebb and flow a little bit from, from a production standpoint. You know, and part of the reason too is, you know, high basis tends to impact cash margins too. So guys, you know, are very aware of that. And, you know, as they're looking at this couple month period before we transition from old crop to new crop, you know, they're aware of what the cost of replacement on corn is too. So, That's true. Yeah. The soybean market, extremely volatile again this week, really yeah. led the grains early in the week. Were yeah. there any substantial changes to the soybean balance sheet? What happened? Not, not, not particularly, although the soybean balance sheet, in our opinion, is objectively tighter than corn as we work into the fall. We're also seeing, you know, some of the hot and dry weather that we're, that we're seeing. We're probably more concerned about bean yield at this point than we are corn yield. Um, there's also a lot of questions on the bean side of the ledger from a demand standpoint too that, that we kind of have to work through. But you know, soybean processor margins are still just outstanding. Um, you know, there's uh, stocks on old crop are fairly tight. They've felt tight for a long time, still feel tight, and it looks like we have a fairly tight outlook as we kind of work into work into this fall too. So on the cash side, yeah. corn basis been very strong in the yeah. countryside. Has bean basis been keeping up? It's it's been extremely strong. We have seen processor basis begin to break a little bit, but we've had massive inverses too. Um, we've, you know, July, August, and, and now August, November, you know, have, have been massive inverses, higher old crop versus, you know, forward values on the curve. That tends to break the basis and flush inventory out sooner, right? And so, so that's, it's doing its job. So we have started seeing processor basis and interior basis break a little bit, but comparatively to what we'd call quote unquote normal, it's, it's still very high. All right, Michael, in this point, are you going to hold off on encouraging soybean sales to see what that August weather brings? That's a, that's a good question, too. I think a lot of guys will. Um, you know, we're, we're still at relatively high prices compared to normal, but it does feel like there's the potential at least for, for some upside in this bean market, at least till we get through pod filling and get a little better look at what, uh, what new crop production is going to look like. A lot still on the radar this year. Michael mm -hmm. Reginelli, ATI, thanks yeah, for joining us this absolutely. week. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next, brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform. Combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. Well, he likes his drone equipment, there's no doubt about it. He's always checking out new drones, but take a look at the software that Chad shares with us this weekend. Yeah, I love talking about drones, Max, that's right. 
This week's tech segment, I'm going to feature some technology around drones. This is the Flying Egg system called the DJI Air 2S, and I love the compact size, I love the price point, but one of the challenges has been with this new system is we couldn't use it with any mapping software like Drone Deploy. Drone Deploy is really the benchmark of that type of software, but the reason why I'm putting it on the tech segment is here in the last week, their software has been released for use on this drone. And you can see right here, I'm using my iPhone. I'm going through the process of setting up a flight. The workflow is super easy. I'm going to do a short little flight here for you. It's about five acres. You can see it's going to take about 50 images or so. We're going to fly at 200 feet. Once I've got that set, I'm going to go ahead and hit the checklist button, and you're going to see it go through all the pre-flights. It's going to check the camera, the controller, all those things. Once it's done... I'm going to hit start flight, and as you can see, this drone's going to take off and get to work. It's a short flight. It's going to take about five minutes. Once it's done, it comes in and lands, and you'll see here on the screen, it gives you a couple choices. You can upload the data right in the field, or you can wait and do it at your computer. And that's what I've chose today. You can see here, I'm into the file. I'm going to grab those images. I'm going to hit upload. Push the button, you can see all those blue dots, they depict an image that was taken by that drone. Once it's done, that's the cool part. You can start working on that data. You know, I will remind folks, it does take a pretty decent size upload speed, but as long as you've got maybe 15 or 20 meg upload, you'll have no problem at all. Once it's done, you'll go back into the software and you can start looking at that data. And like a puzzle that you stitch together on grandma's kitchen table, Basically, each one of those images, those blue dots, you can click on and you can look at those images in higher resolution. Now, the software has tons of capabilities. Stand count when the crop is small, even some live data you can get in the field. You can see some of the plant health right here. But what I really like about this package is an under $2,000 price point for a drone. This thing is a workhorse, and I love that. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. You can always count on Chad Colby to bring you the latest in drone technology, Mr. UAV there, and we thank him for keeping us abreast of that and all other ag technology weekends here on This Week in Agribusiness. Well, coming up, we have an interesting visit, Mike, just ahead, second part of our show this weekend about asphalt made with the help of soybeans. It'll be in addition to the Farm Progress Show site this year. Stay with us. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. We like to visit from time to time with folks across the country who really have their fingers on the pulse of agriculture. Agriculture journalists, maybe, with some of the magazines, some of the prominent bloggers out there, and certainly, by all means, agriculture broadcasters. We go to that St. Louis region this weekend. Dave Schumacher joins us there. Farmer Dave from KTRS Radio. How have you been, young man? Well, we've been doing pretty good, Max. Uh, we, other than a stretch of about a week of 100 plus temperatures and then six or eight or 10 inches of rain in four hours. But other than that, life's been good. <laughs> and the humidity is always high in the summertime in that region around St. Louis uh, along the Mississippi, isn't it? Absolutely, it's been really tough here. We had a, we had a wet spring, uh, delayed us a little bit. Uh, there was a little bit of a crop planet, then we got wet and, and, and everything got delayed. So we're kind of on a two cycle crop here. We've got the early crop and the late crop. Uh, then we went through the stretch of the, of the 100 plus degrees. Uh, then we got to where we flooded out some ground uh, the last couple of days. So it, it's been a challenging spring in the world of agriculture around St. Louis. I was on a flight this week that went through St. Louis, and as we were on approach, looking down, you could see all of the standing water around. So I knew you'd had some uh, excessive rains there. But with crops this far along, how much of a difference would it make? Well, it kind of depends on what went underwater, Max. It's, uh, you know, the, the, they kind of say, and the theory kind of is, if you stay less than 24 hours underwater, you've got a shot at, at, at coming out of it. Uh, we had about 100 acres of beans uh, that went under about five feet of water. Uh, it was up on top of them about 20 hours, drained back off, but now they're covered with mud. Uh, so will they bloom? Will they, you know, will they pollinate? Will they bloom? They were just getting to that blooming stage. Some say they could re-sprout and still pick up some beans. 
the corn on the north side of the highway where the creek was out just up to the ears now they were telling us that if it gets above the ears and that mud gets in those ears uh, right at pollination and that's where a lot of this corn is it's silking and pollinating uh, that that mud will get on the silks and that'll probably affect the yield so we're really not counting a whole lot on that hundred acres you did say five feet of water not five inches five feet of water uh, in downtown Belleville, which is just our hometown here, just a little bit two miles north of us, there was water. The creeks came out and actually shut the main street down where the creek was going over the main street in Belleville. And the old timer said, I can remember it happening one time when I was a little bitty kid and everybody went to see it. The downtown was underwater uh, and we went to see it and I was driving through there the other day. They had the road closed once again. There was up to 10 inches of rain in some areas in less than six hours. My goodness, that's a lot of water to dump into an area. And of course, the old expression, you were talking about soybeans. The old expression is uh, soybeans don't like wet feet. I guess some of your folks will find that out. Well, in this low ground, yeah, it'll depend on how quick it dries off. They're talking about another possibility of an inch of rain uh, yet, uh, maybe by the, this weekend, um, good news, bad news is if it rains, it'll wash the mud off of those beans, uh, which could help them actually flower and, and, and pollinate. Uh, do we need another inch of rain? You know, in the middle of July, end of July, you catch an inch of rain, you're dancing in the streets, but uh, we've had uh, right at eight inches of rain for the month of July here. Now, I would imagine those high points in the fields are looking pretty good from frequent moisture. Absolutely, yeah. So what you lose in the bottoms, hopefully we're going to pick up on the top. But, uh, you know, you never wish for that kind of rain. And, and the other, on our show, we always talk about, boy, if it just rained, if it would just rain. Well, boy, did I catch it on the text line about careful what you wish for. You asked for it. You got it. Quit whining. So then the next day after the rain, I went on the air and I go, rain, rain, rain. All it does is rain. If it would just quit raining. Quite naturally, I took it on the text line about that as well, you know, about farmers never, never being happy. One person said, has things ever been right on the farm? And I said, well, back in 94, one day for about three hours, things were pretty good. Other than that, it's either bad or good. There's always something, it seems like. This is county fair time. We're seeing a lot of images in the social media. Some places, they're starting state fairs. Have you been out uh, talking to any of the folks at the county fairs? How are they doing? That heat certainly wasn't helpful, but uh, what have you heard otherwise? Well, the fairs that were last week was rough on the kids, uh, rough on the livestock. You know, when it's 100 plus, the livestock's miserable, the kids are miserable, the parents get miserable, everybody gets miserable. Uh, they got through it. They did the best. Now it's going to cool. It's cooling off a little bit. Uh, we're getting ready to head out to the Washington Town and Country Fair. Their big livestock sales coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. We'll be selling that sale for them. Uh, their livestock, you know, as far as getting your livestock even ready to go to the fair when it's over 100 degrees, your hogs, you know, your rate of gains drop, your cattle, the rate of gains drop there as well. Uh, but yeah, the kids, they, they don't care. They, you know, they're always good to go, but the livestock gets a little testy once in a while. <laughs> I should have pointed out, uh, we have just a few seconds remaining, but you're an auctioneer also. Absolutely. And and Max, real quick, if I could, uh, land values are just absolutely gone through the roof. There's been a lot of $16,000 an acre ground selling at auction here in our neighborhood. Pure farmland. Unbelievable numbers. And that's that's yeah. not for development. That's farmland, right? That's farm ground. It'll be farm ground for a long time to come. Yes, sir. It'll be yeah. interesting to watch to see if those prices start to plateau some. Thank you much, Farmer Dave. We sure appreciate it. Good to see you. Always a pleasure, Max. Call anytime. Dave Schumacher there. Dave is on the radio, KTRS. That's 5.50 a.m. there in the St. Louis area. There's more coming up on This Week in Agribusiness. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back to this weekend's edition of This Week in Agribusiness. We promised a little bit earlier we'd bring back the manager of the Farm Progress Show, Matt Youngman. He is here, president accounted for. <laughs> he is indeed. And Matt, I've got a question. I want to take the focus back to equipment, which of course is one of my favorite things to see at Farm Progress, autonomous equipment. You mentioned the rise, the portable copter. What other type of drones and autonomous tractors are going to be on display? Well, there's going to be a lot of different types, and, and we've kind of grouped all this 
new cutting edge equipment into one, one location so folks can go and experience it. It's not something that you can get behind the wheel and experience, but you just view it and, and take it in and talk to the, the, the professionals. And I understand you're gonna be, maybe not breaking the record of corn head size, but getting very close. <laughs> it may be the world's largest corn head. It's a 60 foot wide corn head, a 24 row 30 corn head will be on display there on the show site. And, and I can't say much more about it than that other than, than I'm, I'm confident that it'll be there because we're working on the logistics of actually getting it picked up and placed on the show site on display. So uh, it's it's so that'll be that'll be big and impressive to see. That will be very very cool. And of course when you're walking around all day, it can be hot, it can be tiring. It's nice to pick your spirits up at the end of the day in a concert sometimes a good way to do that. Matt Lee Bryce going to yes. be in Boone. Yeah, we need to thank Case IH for their partnership with Lee Bryce, which is what brings him to the show. We had him there last year and that was, you know, it was just about perfect last year. That Wednesday evening, the weather was beautiful and and everybody was celebrating coming back together at the end of COVID. We've never had a concert inside the fence in Boone. We've done it several times there when we're in Decatur, but this is a first for Boone. So really excited to bring Lee Bryce. And uh, you know, I, I've seen some layouts of the venue. It's gonna be beautiful. It'll be a really fun evening. It was a great time last year in Decatur, Illinois, to be sure. I am going to be there at least a portion of my time there with the inventors. Farm Next, that series that's been sponsored by Pivot Bio, will be bringing the inventors to the Farm Progress Show. And, and I got to thank you for all the heavy lifting you've been doing on that. I mean, the, the, the product that you guys have put together promoting that and, and talking about those inventions has been really cool to watch happen. But to actually see them all together in one place and check out all the inventions, it's a, you know, it's, it, it's great to come to the Farm Progress Show and see all the new great things. But you don't always get that opportunity to see the, the next great patent fresh to the industry. And, and you know, we were talking that, that there's some stuff in there that's just really groundbreaking and cool and, and worth the trip by itself to see the corral or the grain weevil or the clear flame or any of these, any of these uh, inventions that they're just they're just really cool to see folks can map the show and buy their tickets at farmprogressshow.com that's exactly right anything you're going to need to have there farmprogressshow.com we've got the tickets up and ticket sales are going great you know we're, we're running ahead of pace everything is 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 setting up for a really great show thank you matt we appreciate it we'll see you there Boone, Looking iowa to it. the dates august 30th and 31st and september 1st Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead. Presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. We continue to hear more extremes being reported by folks out there. Extreme moisture or a lack of it. Greg, yep. there's still those folks the have-nots are not getting rain at all. Yes, or extreme temperatures There's another parameter to take a look at. Like into interior Washington State last week, those central and eastern sections up past 100 degrees. 115 last week into the northern end of the Sacramento Valley. It is that persistent hot ridge, the heat ridge. The, the ridge riding storms are back in the forecast for some of the drought areas. We'll see what happens. And the moisture has been in excess in parts of the heartland. Not necessarily in the Pacific Northwest. We do have a trough moving inland, a couple of frontal boundaries. We have at least uh, some mid and upper level moisture, but no low level moisture. So the end result, we get these thunderstorms that flare up, but they've been basically lightning producers, no significant rain. And then you really uh, strike up the fire situation. We've seen a northward advance into Idaho, parts of Big Sky Country and Wyoming over the past a week to 10 days. So a little change here in a typical mid to late to summertime setup early in the week across the Pacific North West one frontal boundary ashore kind of stalls out here with slightly cooler air for the Canadian Prairie. Here is the northern extent of some of the triple digit heat Black Hills and points to the east and southeast and maybe a stray shower thunderstorm on this frontal boundary through Idaho parts of uh, Montana into Oregon and more or less just lightning and that's it. No significant rainfall with the heat building back into the northern end of uh, California. Again, pretty typical temperatures for the time of year into areas of California. We've seen some westward movement on some of the the monsoon moisture here the past week to 10 days into southeastern California. So that pattern continues on along with the triple digit heat across the central high plains and points eastward and high humidity values up past 60. You feel at this time of year down through New Mexico and West Texas. Cotton little change to the maps and charts as you would expect for late to July, early August in the southwestern states. Monsoon showers and thunderstorms. Some of those drifting into the high plains areas. Triple digits uh, heat across the Great Plains and maybe a tropical system well offshore backs into the eastern Pacific 
Pacific. Both ends of the basin have been very quiet this far into the season. Do you see the heat continuing in that central plains area? Yes, an eastward advance. Last week, we kind of split the hot ridge over the southeast and across parts of the western states, i.e. Washington State. This week, we get it back together. The band is back together, and here we go into the central and southern plains states, western Corn Belt, and these ridge-riding thunderstorms over the top of the ridge. They slide south and southeast. We need more moisture here. It's been extreme multi-inch north of the drought areas in east central Illinois and of course a foot into parts of Missouri around the St. Louis area. They're still cleaning up from that. Little change with heat, humidity, triple digit readings over parts of maybe western Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas. The thunderstorm clusters to the upper Midwest, Great Lakes region and sliding southeast into the eastern Corn Belt. Again, eastern parts of uh, the belt may see some rainfall later in the week. It's all or nothing in these storm clusters. Uh, into Old Mexico, a couple of thunderstorms on uh, the west end of the monsoon set up some tropical downpours over the Gulf Coast. The heat continues on. No significant drought relief into western Kansas and points on southward. We've seen some of it east and from there into the Ozarks and little change expected for the southern plains. The Delta region late in the week, just hot, humid and maybe a storm or two max. Knowing where the calendar is, I start to watch off the Atlantic coast there, wondering if there's any tropical stuff. Not yet? Nope. Saharan dust. Too much of it. We talked about it last week. It uh, really uh, limits the ability of the atmosphere to bubble up thunderstorm tops too much of that particulate matter and you just kill off the tropical season and that has been the story so far so far mind you doesn't mean it's going to be a quiet one here on out in any event warmth into the northeast of new england still some major drought areas here parts of the central corn belt look at the warm front here tends to stall on out and over the top of the thunderstorm complexes will be downpours perhaps severe weather and these frontal boundaries hung on up delightful here the heat and humidity over the central and western corn belt especially west of the mississippi tough go of a triple digit readings here is the heat wave weather pattern through the delta scattered showers and thunderstorms over the southeast little change expected in quiet weather in the atlantic basin a couple of downpours into parts of uh, southern texas greg sodier is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country presented by pivot bio proven 40 predictable productive weatherproof Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. I have a feeling some of you folks will get quite a bit of rain in the week ahead, depending on where you are situated. Just judging from Greg's maps a few minutes ago, let's look at that precept map for the upcoming week. And you know these thunderstorms, they tend to be random in coverage uh, per day, mm -hmm. scope coverage and intensity, but you add it all up, and that's really what the cumulative effect is, what we're going to play out here for this week uh, with regard to the forecast for moisture. So maybe some spots get it all at once, others may not, and you know how some of these thunderstorms, as we saw last week in that, I-70 corridor, it's all or nothing really, and it's multi-inch and flooding variety. So the snapshot here is of an inch or two. Western Corn Belt late in the week into the southern Great Lakes region, a slide to the east and southeast across parts of the mid-Atlantic region. There'll be some healthy downpours here uh, into the southeastern part of the country. We don't think this is a name system. Nonetheless, a pretty good defeat of tropical moisture, maybe as far west as eastern Texas. Nothing going on into Oklahoma and Texas with just about every crop you could imagine. Blowtorch down here uh, with dry and drought in mind. Some monsoon downpours in the southwest, a couple of thunderstorms in the northwest, but lightning bears, that's it. No significant moisture, high and dry across the valleys of California, and no concern about this tropical system in the uh, eastern Pacific. For the week of August 8th, how much heat will there be? Yeah, here we go. The hot ridge is retrograded just a wee bit. This week it'll be here. We get this westward push into parts of the northern and central plains. Still above average, though, much of the Corn Belt. Normal temperatures over the southeastern part of the country, except the Gulf Coast parts of Texas. We anticipate maybe some cloudiness keeping temperatures there, maybe some moisture. The warmth back into northern California, a little bit of cooler, drier air into the northeast in New England. Precip forecast bodes a little optimism, but it may be of a tropical system or two. We don't think it's named, but a feed into central and south Texas taps into the monsoon moisture in the southwest. Storm clusters, the ridge riding kind of derecho type stuff that you don't want to deal with, but you get rain out of it at least uh, into the upper Midwest, eastern Corn Belt, downpours for Florida, normal precip, uh, more is needed into the northeast in New England. By August 15th, many of the state fairs in the heart of the country are on in earnest, yep. and will they be in heat? Uh, there will be long lines at the beverage stand if you're doing and attending such into parts of the mid Mississippi Valley, northern and central plains, corn belt locales, especially west of the Mississippi, still above average. And at this point in August, that's still above 90 and that's still triple digit heat uh, right here into the northern plains. So we'll monitor that. Temps a bit below average here, but made up by high.
high humidity in the southeastern part of the country, a bit below average across the western reaches of the country. A little optimism for Washington State with moisture. The monsoon moisture makes it all the way up into parts of Nevada. Downpours for the Gulf Coast. We're keeping an eye on the tropics. It's that time of the year. Maybe this is a name system here finally. Mid to late August and a drying out process across much of the Corn Belt. The week of August 22nd. What do you see then, sir? Uh, from a temperature standpoint, here we go. And it is warm, but nothing out of control, uh, but a toasty one for much of the uh, Great Lakes region, eastern Corn Belt, southeastern states. Normal temperatures down through Florida. A little more troughiness here across the northern and central plains. That's a buckling of the jet stream. That allows for some cooler air into the northern Rockies, Pacific Northwest to get that trough position, the U-shaped configuration here. And we get some moisture for the very late uh, planted beans, perhaps, and we'll take it for anything for that matter. Much of the Corn Belt Plain States areas, tropical downpours down through the Gulf Coast, including Florida, watching the western Atlantic here late in August. Uh, moisture up towards the Sioux and back westward into the Pacific Northwest. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. It was a big tractor back in its day, the Minneapolis Moline G1355. I remember seeing one in the field, but now was it really a Minneapolis Moline? Max's Tractor Shed is brought to you by Store Lock Tool Cabinets. Plan to visit them at the 2022 Farm Progress Show. You'll be able to see how attractive those cabinets are. You'll be able to slide the drawers open and see how easily they operate. In the meantime, go to the website to see what they have to offer at storelock.com. Yeah, I think I was somewhere south of Lafayette, Indiana, maybe on US 231 that summer of 1974, but I saw one of these. It looked like a beast out of the field operating out there. It said Minneapolis Moline on both sides, but now there might have been a little bit of an identity crisis for this tractor. On the front and on the rear, it said white, and it came out of the Oliver plant at Charles City, Iowa, one of the last tractors to roll out of that plant. White well, did also make a spirit of Minneapolis Moline as late as 1988, Sherry Schaefer reminded us. Sherry, the editor of Heritage Iron and Oliver Heritage magazines. But this Minneapolis Moline belongs to Jerry Inger at Serena, Illinois. He'd probably be proud to share with you a little bit more about that mini mo story. Let's find out what's selling at Big Iron Auctions of the week ahead. Here's Mark Stock. Hi, Max. We're into August, and boy, do we have some nice equipment selling August the 3rd. Connolly Farms from Ulmer, South Carolina. They'll be selling a 2014 Case IH Patriot 4430 sprayer. Parker Construction LLC from Warrensburg, Missouri. They've got a 2015 Takeuchi Mini Excavator. They have two Case 580 Series loader backhoes. Owens Ag out of Carroll, Nebraska. They've got a 2015 John Deere 79 forage harvester with only 709 hours on the cutter. They'll also have a John Deere 770 Kemper forage head. They've got a John Deere 7800 Series mechanical front tractor. Larry Averill is from Wellsville, Kansas. He's got a 2021 Sunflower 5035, 22-foot field cultivator just like a new one. Then on Thursday, August the 4th, Galen Kelser from Othello, Washington will sell 62 items. A 2009 Challenger MT845C track tractor with an overhauled motor. They've got a 2006 Peterbilt 379 semi-truck. It's got the Cummins motor and a 13-speed. They'll be selling a 2011 John Deere 6430 mechanical front tractor. They have a John Deere 490 excavator with a hydraulic thumb. Super well cared for equipment selling in Othello, Washington here once again, August the 4th. Max calls are coming in from all across the United States, so Big Iron will stay busy selling quality equipment anywhere in North America. And now it's time to meet another young leader coming up through agriculture's ranks. This week, we're meeting Raquelin Rayburn. She is the past Big Sandy River State Vice President for the state of Kentucky. Raquelin, thank you so much for joining us. And tell me, what was the highlight of your year of service there as the Vice President in Kentucky? The highlight this year was basically just seeing new members and being able to actually interact with them. Um, past years we've had COVID and we weren't able to see them or interact with them and we had to do everything through Zoom. So being able to see them and basically just be able to be there with them in present to impact them and to 
inspire them and for them to inspire us. Absolutely, and of course, convention is a very inspiring time for a lot of FFA members. Raquelin, how was Kentucky's annual convention this year? Oh, I could not imagine another way that we could spend it. It was great. It was just really good seeing all the members there and seeing their smiling faces. That is fantastic, and I imagine that interaction between members and leaders is probably part of what prompted you to join FFA. Raquelin, what else was it about that program that made you want to get involved? Well, I have always lived on a farm my whole life, and when I first got into 4-H, I learned more about FFA, and all my cousins were in FFA, either as a member or as an officer, so I wanted to just get in it with them and to see what it's all about, and as soon as I joined, I instantly fell in love, and honestly, by being in FFA, it's made me a bigger person to myself, and I've learned more about how I can influence others myself as well. That is fantastic, Raquelin. And as you look to continue influencing others in the future, what do your plans include? Well, currently I'm in college for pre-veterinary medicine. So I'm hoping to become a veterinarian and work on large animals in my county because we really lack on the large animal portion. And hopefully next summer I'll be able to travel out of the country to work in a vet clinic and work with different animals myself. And then also outside of being a veterinarian, I hope to try out for the USA archery team. Oh, well, we wish you the best of luck, Raquel, and we do need more large animal vets across rural America, so we hope you get the job done. Thanks for joining us and good luck as you continue your career in agriculture. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Earlier in the program, we were speaking with Matt Youngman about the Farm Progress Show coming to Boone and the improvements that are being made to those show grounds. And Max, Iowa soybean growers are helping with these improvements in a way, aren't they? That show site at Boone gets improved every time we go out there. And there's an improvement at the Varied Industries tent for the Farm Progress Show coming up this year. Rob Ewald is here to visit with us about it, president of the Iowa Soybean Association. Rob, first, let me get a quick crop report from you. How do your fields look in the eastern part of Iowa, Scott County, Iowa? They're looking really good, Max. Uh, we've had, we've been blessed with timely rains and, and uh, things are green. We've been out. Uh, finishing up the last of our fungicide and, and beans look great, corn looks great. Uh, we had excellent pollination. I, I think we're, we have a pretty good year set up. We'll keep our fingers crossed. As we learned August 10th of 2020, it's not in the bin until it's in the bin, right? Correct. We, got a, we have a long ways to go, but uh, things, uh, you know, good Lord will provide. We'll be all right. Coming up at Boone, many of us will be walking on something that has a tie to Iowa soybeans. Share with us what's going to be happening there. You bet. In the in the Varied Industries uh, tent, there we we uh, the Iowa Soybean Association is sponsoring and, and putting down some asphalt there to make it a little bit a uh, little bit nicer for for all the all the visitors to come in and, and enjoy. And, and we're doing it with high oleic soybean oil. So it's a it's. It's quite a venture that Iowa State University has been researching and, and uh, trying to find new uses and to, and to help us with uh, our infrastructure at the same time. For folks who might not be familiar with this, you're actually using recycled asphalt and then, then the soybean oil is, is a binder. Do I understand that right? That is correct. That is correct, Max. Yeah, it, uh, it's, it's all recycled and then we're using the high oleic oil as the binder in there and, it, and it's it's still in testing in in uh for highway use but uh the what we're seeing for the preliminary results it's it's a great product it's it's l less expensive and it's and it's holding up better than than the historically the the binders that they would have used in reclaimed asphalt how cool is that? I mean, what a win-win proposition. And, and I know you farmers are probably just as concerned as other growers are about our nation's infrastructure. When you're hauling grain to the elevator or over to the river, uh, you're probably going over some roads that are getting beaten up and torn up and need to be maintained in many instances. So uh, this is kind of a win-win all the way around, isn't it, if we can see more of this developed? Oh, it's, it's, it is. It just, it takes a while for the testing so so that the departments of transportation throughout the United States will adopt it. So it takes a lot of testing 
but you know it's a it's a great way to increase demand for our, our soy oil um and and again i uh, i drive truck too and and i sure like being able to drive down a smooth asphalt instead of hitting those buckles and all that concrete as we're driving down the road so it, it it'll it'll be a big improvement it's a you know this is a project that we've been working on probably for 10 years um uh and and i think it's it's a great way to show the farmers how those checkoff dollars are being used to research new new demand for our products. Well, think about you folks as we stroll into the Varied Industries tent and walk by to see the exhibitors there and to, to see the variety of products. Thanks for sharing the story with us, Rob. Thank you, Max. Rob Ewald, president of the Iowa Soybean Association. That's so neat to see new demand for soybeans coming, and you can experience it underneath your feet at the Farm Progress Show. You know, I've got a stretch of asphalt I'd like to recycle, and <laughs> bring in some of that soy product. Mrs. Armstrong would be much happier <laughs> if we did that, as a matter of fact. Don't forget those dates for the Farm Progress Show, August 30th and 31st and September 1st, farmprogressshow.com. You'll see Mike Pearson there and the guy that hangs out with him. We hope you have a great week. Have a safe week. So long, everyone. Closed captioning for This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Kubota. Shape your world. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by OMAX Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.